there's a Hello, everybody. My name is Jerrica Ahmed Levitt. I am from Mitchell and I have a book that I will be reading. And this book is called Adunga Nevelik, which translates to his name is Nevelik. Nevelik in any Pak language is a goose. Adunga Nevelik. His name is Nevelik by Jerrica Nayak Levitt. Any Pak translations edited by Susie Frankson. All artwork by Jerrica Nayak Levitt. Atinga Nevelik. Nevelik Aliu Lusuk Dok. Nevelik Nunamilu Tarayur Milu. Kauni Kaptulu Aliu Renaptulu. Nerlek Kanyak Dog, Mit Kungalu, Kangingalu, Summan, Mit Kadipka, Kilbak, but Tinukulak Balu, Asi Sulavik, Nerlek Ukalak Dog. Nerlek Taduk Dog, Kayak Dumik, Mitchi Kiruk Dog, Kayak Dudun, Avalan, Kadak Dog, Kayak Dumit Jok, Nerlek Nerlek Tadutuk, Sihirimik, Ejiruktuk, Nunamun, Sihiritun, Avalan Amiruk, Sihirimi, Jok, Nerleruk. Nerlek Tadutuk, Tutumik, Nerizukuk, Tutudun, Avalan Tingaraturulai, Jok, Tutumi, Jok, Nerleruk. Nevelek Taduk Duk Achlamik, Siniruk Duk Achlatun, Avalan, Siniru Light Chok, Kajogni, Achlami Chok, Nevelaru. Nevelek Taduk Duk Tulermik, Amonela Suk Duk Kalumik Tulitun, Avalan, Pumi Light Chok. To Lerumi Chok Nerlaru Nerlef Taduk Duk Amoromik Mamoruk Duk Amorudun Marlan Pupiku Laruk Amorumi Chok Nerlaru Nerlef Taduk Duk Kinga Lermik Mit Kumaruk Duk, Kingalik Dun, Arlan, Mit Kutini, Kirak Dut, Tingak Bulak Dulu, Kingal Ryumi Chok, Nerla Ruruk, Nerlek Taduk Duk, Suluk Bauramik, Anaksaruk Duk, Kumi, Suluk Bauradun, Arlan, Tau to sweet chop, kumi, slup bow room, slup bow room, eat chop, never love room. Never left out of is a roomy, only rook. Not you meet chop, never Nerlek Tauduk Duk Nanumik Selrizuk Duk Sikumi Nanudun Avalan Kemit Chok Nanumit Chok Nerla Ruru Nerlek Asiwurup Ila Alira Napto Alira Naptuma Alira Nalaruma Kinyaranaktuma, 
Et continuum et se ramenant ne relèvent que l'acteur. Ne relèvent tout à l'irrunac du si ne relèvent tout. Voyez n'a pas. Ovlami, Ovanga Aluk Edwardson, but Carving me Ruronga, but Carving me a Nami Ronga, Apaka George Edwardson, Akara Debbie Edwardson. Bright Shores, uh, Bright Shores Me Director. Hello, uh, good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. I'm Alu Gebertson, and I'm sharing a story today, a story from my Elders Elders um, reference that was written to be shared with the younger generation. Uh, this is a story sharing particularly for Inupiaq people, which are indigenous people to Northern Alaska. And uh, we stretch um, across the Northern and Western parts of Alaska. And this story comes from the Puyarikat, right? The Puyarikat is a transcription of the 1978 Elders Conference. Uh, it's our Elders, Elders Wisdom. And something that they said um, when they met was, was when the elders met, they talked about things which they knew, things which must be passed on to our young people if they are going to subsist on this land which has been ours for generations. They have to know their land and its history. So I was born and raised in Atkarvik. I was born and raised in a part a decolonized part Western household. We had an interesting mix, but by and large, um, I was raised with traditional stories. I was raised with different understandings of uh, religion and spirituality and different ways to look at money and material substance, material stuff. Uh, my parents uh, really thankfully uh, didn't bring me up in a household that was focused on uh, status, power, or money. It was focused on love, children, family, and stories. And so as we go to this time, um, I, 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 into the darkness here, into the winter, I wanna, I wanna share some stories, especially with my relatives and my friends and community members in the North. Um, although this is for anybody who wants to listen. So this is uh, the storyteller Elijah uh, Of all the people, I am most aware of these things because I am old. This is on page 42 if you have the Puyarikat. <clears throat> At one time, I had endeavored to acquire something from two old men, two people of my land. One of them was Amos Morris and them grandfathers, their mother's father, and his wife was my father's older sister. They lived to be so old that in order to get around, they had to crawl. They had to crawl to get around, they had become so feeble. When I became about 20 years old, when I had already acquired a wife, I endeavored to acquire from these two men how the earth came to be. From these two who had become so feeble, they had to crawl. Because you see, I was thinking they must be the first two people. These two must be the first two people, I thought. This is what I had begun to think. These must be the first two people because they had become so old they had to crawl to get around. They could not go out by themselves. I got married when I became 20 years old. I got married. I cautiously asked one of them a long time ago when you were old, what did you hear sometimes regarding the beginnings of the universe? That is what he himself hears, he said. It is said that at that time, long ago, their sky was that which is now down under us. And it was darkness. It was that other one down under. It is said that it was dark 
there was no sun. That other sky down under was dark. After it was that way for a time, the earth turned over. This is what one of them said. Then I proceeded to ask the other, this person that had become so old, he had to crawl to get about. At that time, long ago, when you were young, what did you hear? It is said that our sky then was that which is now down under. He said, a long time ago, our sky was that which is now down under. And then our sky turned and it became the sky that we have now. These two old men from whom I was trying to acquire something, they both said the same thing. I was not about to stop there, for I am by character one who does not leave things be. I cautiously asked the other one, <clears throat> do you know how the people began to multiply and increase at that time long ago? The other one, whom I asked first, when I asked him that, he answered, it is said that when they were down under, there was a person, a wolf, wolves while they were down there. A wolf had two children, a little girl and a little boy. And from these two people multiplied and increased while they were still down there. That is what the other one said to me. Here, I was asking all these questions because I was after acquiring something. I was trying to acquire something. When he told me this, I proceeded to ask the other. At that time long ago, what did you hear regarding how people began to multiply and increase? He said that he heard that when they were still down there, the wolves had a little girl and a little boy and from the people started to multiply and increase before the sky turned over. It is said that from these wolves, this part wolf, this young person, this little girl and little boy came all the people and began to multiply and increase, he said. I call myself part wolf to myself. Also Paniak, he also calls himself that. These two said that these were our beginnings. Koyinak Bok for listening. Um, we'll be reading more from this uh, really important Anupak reference for Anupak people. Uh, we'll get talk a little bit more as we go about the ways people talked, like uh, Kakinyak here. He repeated himself many times um, so that many people could hear what he had to say. Remember, this was before video or anything like that. I don't want to assume that's why he repeated himself, but a lot of Anupak storytellers repeat themselves. Um, and they say things in very specific ways, like my father. So I, I really value this reference because it, um, it wrote it down exactly as they said it. Um, and there's a lot to be learned about how our elders spoke to each other, the respect, the humility, the patience, and the, the waiting that you know, they gave each other. I even catch myself sometimes jumping in and I remind myself that my elders always sat back. They never reached forward. They sat back and listened. And when they were good and ready, they spoke. Most of my elders were like that. Um, I hope hearing these words today brought you some joy, uh, some warmth, uh, maybe got you to think a little bit about the world we live in today and, and how we look at origins and how we look at darkness. So with that, um, I wish you wellness as, as we move into this next week. Stay tuned uh, for more. Hey everybody, it's Olive with Bright Shores again for today, and I'm sharing from the Puyalitkat, from our series, Stories from the Puyalitkat. This is a series for anybody who's interested, but especially for Inupak people, as this is an ancient Inupak history reference, 1978 Elders Conference, our elders, elders. So let's hear from them today. Um, what's calling to me to share with you is on page 92 
and we're going to hear from Uyagaluk, Lori Kingik. So he says, although I am not a very old man, I am Lori Kingik. Eskimo name means big old rock. I have a name which is heavier than anything else. And so sometimes I became, I become frustrated with my namesake when it slows me down when I am going by dog sled. Although I do sometimes get frustrated with my namesake, it is number one because it does not easily become useless. Also, something with which I used to hear when I traveled the land. A person from Wales talked to me one time. When I mentioned that I had a father who was from Barrow, Nuvok, which is the old town site, one of the old town sites, Barrow, Barrow or Utkjalvik, as you know, it is relatively new. He said, maybe I should go see the land of my ancestors. Those, my ancestors. Over there where the people of Wales, along here, a creek. Wales is an island off of Western Alaska. And up there on its side, it was uninhabited, except for some weathermen. They were real Eskimo weathermen. They were trained by their uh, parents and grandparents and great grandparents. It was a lineage of uh, weather knowledge that was passed down. That's what he's referring to. Over on the other side, he said, was the land of my ancestors. Well, they are today trying to inform us of things concerning the land of our ancestors. Let us go there and see it, he said, when he climbed up with me. All around were little mounds, old sod house sites. Those old sod house sites belong to people of the Harisakari, he said. And these here, people of the Sinarmin Kari. And he said, when those people up there hunted, they would enter this creek. A kargi is, um, uh, it's a lot of things, a state of mind, a ceremonial meeting house, a performance space. Um, it's also a plan that you kind of, some Inupak people belonged through too. Not all Inupak people were part of Kavgis, but there were Inupak Kavgis that were led by Umealiks, led by whaling captains and their wives or husbands. After, and then they would work hard on the game they caught up there at the creek. After going on like this, it was found that one of these people up there killed a person of the Sinarmi Kargi. After killing somebody, some of those people up there, it was found, becoming scared, fled. It is said there were three boats. Those that left from this Karlisak Kargi area, traveling along, traveling, they finally ended up to Barrow. That is where Barrow grew from, it is said. Now, he may have been lying. I talked a little bit about it from what I have heard. That one over there, is one I used to call my fellow Kadgi member. That story which that person from Wales told me, I won't just give to you gathered here. Maybe some people who will come after us when they hear it will find it helpful, these which you speak today. It will surely become lost if you don't speak of it. Everything will become lost. It is good that this has started. The way of life of the Anupit has become very different since I was a child becoming aware. Koinak, thank you. I have spoken again up to this point. Join us again next week for another story from the Puyarit Kat to learn from our ancestors. or Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you're watching this. I'm going to share one story we shared yesterday during our Sunday wellness group. We shared a, a number of stories from a couple different places across the Arctic, all about Imanarak, uh, which is the word I was raised with for little people, Imanarak. It's also Inuk in um, interior Alaska. And um, through this story that we read yesterday in Unipkangich, 
uh, Nenemut stories, stories from the England people. My cat ate that part. Um, I didn't rip it off. <laughs> so we're gonna hear from, um, they're in the top, there in this top right here is uh, Homer Makiana, also from AKP. Uh, here is Elijah Kakinya, who we're gonna hear from today and we've heard from before. And this right here is Simon Paniak, all um, notable and very, very um, respect, well-respected leaders from Anaktuvik Pass. Anaktuvik Pass. So, um, hope, hope we have some Nunamuts who are listening in. We're gonna read the story from Elijah Kakinya called Inungulurat, Inungulurat. Translated in this book as the dwarves um, or little people. So, now before we begin this story, I want you to know that there is trauma in this story. There is death in this story. And um, there's loss, there's anger. Uh, we're reading this story today not to bring those things up without any solutions and to release it raw into the universe, but so that we can learn from this story ways to respond. So in particular, there's a loss of a baby, loss of a child, of a little person's child, right? And then there's a loss of a dog. So I wanna be honest and upfront. Bright Shores is, is very sensitive to uh, traumatic uh, triggers, and there's a lot of them in the world today. So please uh, feel safe that I won't guide you astray. So Elijah Kakinya starts. Now I'm going to tell Grandfather Avik's story. From down there at Savavailak, from the mouth of Itchkirk, from the Colville River, the people moved up there. They were on their way up here to Tulurak Lake, up here to Anaktuvuk Pass. They were planning to travel here to John River. In the summer, after having gone to Utkirvik to wrestle, they had wrestled at Nidlik and had found who was the strongest wrestler among them. And they had a kayak race, a foot race, and a rowing race in Umiaks. And they had dried much white fish there at Nidlik. When they came from Utkiarvik after having wrestled and having tried to win, they went up here along the Colville and came first to Sarvailak down there. Then they spent the fall down there at the mouth of the Anaktuk River working to get meat and roots and berries and fish and hunting for tutu or caribou, spearing them from kayaks. And they had, a, they had no light clothes at all then, not even one yard of calico. All their clothes were tutu, caribou skin, for there was nothing else to be had in the inland area, see? Right? <clears throat> their needles were pieces of copper, you see, homemade. They had copper needles, which they made themselves. Then they started to move up in fall when they became able to, and on their way up, up here at Tulugak, right, move up in fall in altitude, right? In the neighborhood of Kanlumavak, 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 or of Tulurak Lake, or else in the neighborhood of Hunt Folklore, Hunt Fork here, they encountered two travelers. They, the travelers, had a tiny little child, a tiny, tiny little son. That little dwarf child was walking between them. They also had a sled and were well equipped and had provisions. When the people on their way up met the two dwarves, they began to travel with them. After they had talked with each other, then those who had become their traveling companions, that tiny little boy, their tiny little son, suddenly the dog snatched him and ate him up. Then his father grabbed the dog by its feet and its hind legs, smashed, smashed it by snapping it like a whip and killed it. And with his little flint knife, he cut up its belly and seized his little son, but the dog had already destroyed him. And when he had taken him and realized that he had died instantly, he said that those he would kill, all those big people to avenge his little son. 
very upset, losing their child. Understand the anger. All those people could not handle the single little person. They were afraid of him. He was small but strong and more powerful than all of them. From his sled, he grabbed his little bow and little arrows and fastened them to his waistband, strapping them to his waist, that little bow of his. Having fastened them to his waistband, he was ready to shoot at them, but they did not respond to his challenge. They were a big group of people, numerous, but they were afraid that they could not kill him, that they could not shoot him because he was small and powerful. They were big, and if he started shooting, he could shoot them easily. The dwarf meant to take them all. When he had girded himself and with a threatening look was about to shoot at them, the people said to him, bedding, skins and soles and spotted seals and bearded seals and whale blubber and spotted seal blubber and as, as much as you can take, we can give you. They said to him, for they were afraid that he who was small would murder them all if he attacked them. When they said to him, when they said that to him, the dwarf's expression changed. It improved. When they saw that his face had become a little better than before, they said further to him, it was the dog, the mad one who killed your son. We would never have killed him. That really mad, crazy dog killed him, they said. Then that little one answered them, if somehow you'll let me have those things you mentioned, I might accept them. As soon as he said that, the people eagerly began to offer, the Anubiate did, the people of the lower Colville. We can give you as much as you can take, as much as you want, whatever you mention of what we have, they said to him. The little person agreed, and his wife too. For you'll certainly have another child. You are young, they said to him. When they said that to them, they believed it and were glad for the payment they got. And the little person wasn't angry anymore. And the people said, what do you want? They said to him, well, he said, he could take furs and tutu skins, caribou skins, or okurok, seal, uh, bearded seals, or spotted seals, nachuk, or blubber. All that he could use, he said, but their clothes he could not use, he said. Their prepared implements, clothes, arrows, or bows, he could not use. He said, for they were too big for him. Nor could he use their women's knives or other knives, nor their tents. He could use only those raw materials, he said. When they said, that, when they said this to him, he asked them to bring those skins of their game. And they gave him blubber and caribou skins, all they had mentioned. Then the little people took the things and put them into their tiny little sled. When they had loaded these things, they asked the people to step aside from them. When the people had stepped aside, the two took off, first along the ground, dragging their sled. Then they rose, and rising more and more as they went, those two little people ascended into the air, into a cloud. And here, nowadays, the little people are gone, apparently being up there in the air. That's what Grandfather Avec used to say about them. That's the end of the story. And here is a drawing uh, by Ronald uh, Sinomitok. So one of the questions we posed, I don't want to make this too long, but one of the questions we posed It's Aluk with Bright Shores, and it is our Storytelling Monday. We're doing stories from the Puyawikat. It's a Puyawikat storytelling session here. We are going to tell the um, an ancient origin story for Inupak people and most Inuit people. It's a very, very old story, one of our oldest, and it's the story about how the sun and the moon came to be. This story does have some sexual trauma in it and some physical trauma, but we do think it is safe for children uh, because this story and like many other legends were told 
in an effort to discourage incest, to discourage sexual molestation. It was talked about, it was discussed. Um, and so we are this week focusing on abuse during the holidays, because that is often when children get abused, when when uh, when parents might, might be drinking or otherwise um, unattentive to their children um, in large gatherings. And hopefully not a lot of that is happening right now, but in case it is, or in case you experienced that and need a story to help ground you, here, here is one. So here on the Puyalikat, we are going to start <clears throat> on page 47 in chapter two. We're gonna, we're gonna hear from Kakinyak, who we've heard quite a bit from. So Kakinyak told us about two very, very old men that he met. Um, and he asked some questions about. And so he's gonna continue, he's, he's asked them some questions. On 47, he says, the sun and the moon, these two, when I was trying to acquire from these two old people, I finally went home. These two who were the oldest people, I caught them while they were still alive. It is said there was this little village after the earth turned, a little village. It is said that this one person had two children, two people. She had a boy and a girl, these two people. Well, it is said that Elijah talks much. People would answer that affirmatively. Elijah is the storyteller. It is said also that this young lady would deliver food to the Kadgi. This young lady, while her older brother was a member of the Kavigi. Kavigis are ceremonial houses that people belong to, somewhat like clans, um, but a bit different. Um, uh, a lot similar, actually. <laughs> we had, had their own songs, their own dances, their own um, sewing patterns, right? Uh, so, so they're a part of this one Kavigi, is what this story says. It is also said that this young lady would deliver food to the Kadgi. This young lady, while her older brother was a member of the Kadgi. And then one night, a man started to molest her, the only daughter of these two people. The boy was their only son also. Then every night, the man would molest her, this young lady. After a time, this young lady started wanting to know who it was she wanted to know. I wonder what kind of man it is that does this to me in the night. She brought along a piece of charcoal. The next night he came to her again. She marked him on his cheek with the piece of charcoal she had brought along because she wanted to find out who that man was. She just marked him with the charcoal. She wanted to find out once and for all the next morning when she woke up. Well, I got this story from those two also. From them, I have endeavored to acquire something. The next day, when she delivered food to the Kadgi, she looked around at the men. She looked around at these men. To her surprise, she saw that her older brother had the mark of the charcoal on him. She started thinking. So I see it was my older brother who has been molesting me. She went home. When she got home, she dug in her small belonging sack and took out a, a rough rock and then cut off one of her breasts. She cut it off. Then she cut off the other breast also. She took off for the Kadgi. When she entered, she told her older brother, here, let these be your wives. My older brother, let these be your wives. She gave her two breasts to her older brother. Then she started going upward. She set off. Following the sky, she was on her way to become the sun. It is said that she was on her way up there to become the sun. That is why the sun is red when it comes up because the blood dripping from her breasts. And so this one, her older brother, after staying inside the Kadgi for a while, grabbed his tool bag and a whale's shoulder blade, blade to take along. A bone he to took hold of, <clears throat> a bone he took hold of his tool bag and whale's shoulder blade and started off toward the direction of his younger sibling. It is said that his younger sibling had become the sun. And then it is said her older brother became the moon. 
It is said that when it became daylight, they would frequently try to cause us to tell some untrue things. But I am just telling some things which have been passed on to me, things that I have acquired from these two. When another day came, when the moon came out, he would pull out ever so slowly of the whale's shoulder blade. And when another day came, he would pull it out ever so slowly to show just a little bit more. And thus eventually the moon would become nice and round. And then when it starts on its way toward becoming gone, in a like manner, he would push it ever so slightly till eventually he caused the moon to become lost. And so I have talked again this time about the moon. If you have any questions, there's more. I have endeavored to acquire stories from these two, from Ikakak and Tulurakbak. And before we go on, for any children watching, I want you to know that what that story says is that incest is not okay, that somebody abusing you is not okay. And if somebody is doing that to you, then I want you to tell somebody, somebody that you trust, somebody that'll keep you safe. If you don't have anybody around, um, I encourage you to keep your eyes open and your ears open. Maybe it's a pastor, maybe it's a teacher, maybe it's a cousin. So um, that story also uh, is, is very true for a lot of us. Um, sexual abuse can happen outside of the family, it can happen inside of the family. But as we saw with that story, the abuse um, that was being inflicted upon the girl uh, caused her to, to feel so much pain inwardly that she cut her own body, um, which, was, which was being used by the man and gave it to her, him. And then he became the moon. And I think sometimes, you know, in other cultures, when we see a red, red sun or an eclipse, um, that's often a bad omen. And so I think this story ties anything red we see on the sun to uh, something very taboo in Inuit culture before colonization. So colonization brought sexual abuse. Um, there might have been sexual abuse before that, but it wasn't nearly as rampant. Um, we, we are not peoples that have originally sexually abused our children. That's, we believe our children are sacred. And so I wanna, wanna point that out. I'm gonna continue reading a little bit because they, can, they talk a little bit more about eclipses. And so if that story was hard for you, I encourage you to reach for stories that give you comfort. I encourage you to talk to people who you, you trust. I encourage you to do things you know that help you feel better, whether that's a bath or a walk. Um, if, if harmful things make you feel better, I, I encourage you to join us in our sober campaign. Um, whatever you need to be sober from, um, I'm sober um, from any harmful and addictive substances. Um, I take medication, but other than that, um, I, I keep myself very sober. Um, for for the work that we need to do and for our children uh, but you can join our campaign we have resources on our um, on our social media pages and you can always reach out and we're happy to, to provide you with resources if you're a kid or an adult and you need need some support we're a safe place to go so continuing on Uyagaluk Lori Kingik says this which he is talking about saying the woman became the sun and her older brother, the moon. I fortunately, and then Kakinya, Elijah Kakinya says, I fortunately have a helper again. I see that I did not lie. Fortunately, I have a helper here. Um, Pinerluk, Bessie Erechluk says, you are not lying. And then Uverak, Ernie Frankson says, in that story, the man's name was Alenyak. And when my grandfather told me the legend, I don't remember it. But the man we learned had the name Alignyak. Ah, that was it. Alignyak. Yes, naming him Alignyak. He, he spells it, he says it differently a couple times. That's why I'm saying it differently. He, it's spelled differently. And then uh, Nulautak, uh, Oliver James says, what did you, what, do, what to did you say? Kenyak says, I'm very fortunate to have ones to say these for me. Paner Luch, Bessie Erich Luch says, I'm going to ask you where it is said these beads grew from. What? Where did the old beads grow from? Where did the old beads grow from? They're 
talking about blue trade beads, which used to be a form of currency. You could get a lot for one blue trade bead. How did they grow? How did the first ones come to have so many beads? What did they do? How was it that they came to have so many old beads? Penelope wants to know. Rekinyar says, did they come to have many beads? Panerlok says, these beads, it is said, I myself have heard before ever daylight came during the dark time. My grandmothers would tell stories. It is said there was sand there in the dark. It was these beads. They would treat the beads just like sand. All around were beads before it turned over. Nisharnak, Henry Nisharnak. Um, Nishanak said, when the kayaker arrived at the place where there is no daylight, he felt around and took some because they were nice and round. Kusik says, you should continue the storytelling with the one about the kayaker, include it with the other. Flossie Hobson says, do you have anything to add to Kakinya's story? Uyagaluk says, the last one? Flossie Hobson, e, yes. <clears throat> I guess I don't have much to add to it. I always have heard it that way. And when, and when he talked of the shoulder blade, that he also told correctly. It is not true that when the moon is just showing a little, it is very narrow. E, someone says. It is said that this, that, that happens when it wants to open. And then it keeps opening wider and wider until it is finally lit. Someone says, those are just legends. They are not, nothing. Someone else says, well, you see, we are listening to some very old stories. Then Uyagaluk says, it is not often said that there are eclipses. We have heard of it, and we also witness it ourselves. When they talk of this, they say that when the woman and her older brother go to see each other, the moon covers the sun. That is the way I often hear it. These which the people speak regarding those things do not differ from each other. This is what I hear regarding those two. It is said that when they want to meet, the moon covers her older brother and thus causes an eclipse. When they, and then Kikinyak says, when they wish to talk to each other. Aluk, another Aluk, my Atak, who I knew, Bertha, Bertha Levitt. What about when the sun is eclipsed? They say that when the sun eclipses, the moon covers it, says Uyagaluk. And when the moon eclipses, it is said that a close star covers it. <clears throat> that This is what I hear of those two. Penelope says, we in our area, she's from Point Hope, believe it eclipses when it is heavy hearted, when it becomes tired of carrying rubbish. I guess the people from Point Hope explain it that way. Point Hope is also known as Tikiak. Uyagaluk, the moon's occupant, it is said, that there was a person on the moon at that time long ago. Although the astronauts do not talk about whether or not there was anyone on the moon, it is said that at that time long ago, the shamans used to visit the moon. We have heard down in Kotzebue that the shamans have visited the moon in recent times by flying. I guess they must have had their own airplanes. Long story session for this week. Hope you enjoyed the stories and um, be well, stay well, and, and work towards wellness. My job is to make college easier because students have a lot on them. Sorry, coach. Plates. Like Harper, an econ major who piles on the pressure. Grammarly can help. Welcome to this asynchronous cultural education learning module. I'm Aluk Edwardson, the cultural educator who put these modules together. I, like many others on this planet, am a multicultural person. I was raised in Northern Alaska with one foot 
in my indigenous traditional community and one foot in the colonized world many of us live in today. For our purposes, colonization can be understood as the systemic abuse of power to benefit one group of people over another. This systemic abuse of power can be regarding land, subsistence rights, individual and communal sovereignty, spirituality, and access to clean water, air, and additional resources. Decolonization efforts support the unity of indigenous history, perspectives, art, science, and spirituality with indigenous people. Decolonization efforts can also encourage awareness and responsive action in people who primarily identify with their colonial heritage. Let's start our journey off with something very cultural indeed. Pictured is a young woman covered in colored dye enjoying Holi Festival in Jaipur, India. What is culture? Culture can be understood as the dynamic framework by which a society makes meaning, constitutes ways of being, and reproduces itself as a recognizable community. Culture, it turns out, is the way that every brain makes sense of the world. That is why everyone, regardless of race or ethnicity, has a culture. Think of culture as the brain's software for the brain's hardware. Culture is like the air we breathe, permeating all we do. And the hardest culture to examine is often our own. Because our own shapes our actions in ways that seem invisible and normal. Most social scientists today view culture as consisting primarily of the symbolic, ideational, and intangible aspects of human societies. The essence of a culture is not its artifacts, tools, or other tangible cultural elements, but how the members of the group interpret, use, and perceive them. It is the values, symbols, interpretations, and perspectives that distinguish one people from another in modernized societies. It is not material objects and other tangible aspects of human societies. People within a culture usually interpret the meaning of symbols, artifacts, and behaviors in the same or similar ways. Understanding Cultural Depth Culture can be understood in reference to three distinct cultural layers. The first layer can be understood as surface culture. Surface culture includes things that you can see, hear, touch, or taste. Some of these things include food, flags, festivals, clothes, holidays, music, games, literature, language, and art. The second layer of culture can be understood as shallow culture. Shallow culture includes concepts of time, personal space, eye contact, ways of handling emotion, including reacting to and expressing emotion, nonverbal communication, how we raise children, thoughts on wellness and illness, and the tempo at which we each individually and as societies work. The third and last layer of culture can be understood as deep culture. Deep culture includes decision-making, concepts of the self, worldview, spirituality, notions of fairness or justice, a preference for competition or cooperation, your relationship to nature and animals, and definitions of kinship. Now we're going to take a moment to explore your cultural identity. This is a moment for reflection, journaling, introspection, and listening to yourself. Feel free to journal on paper or on the computer. Think through this in your mind or out loud. 
The questions I want you to think about are listed on the slide. The first is, what does the surface culture you were raised with look like? You can refer to slide six regarding cultural depth to reread what surface culture is if needed. Next, I'd like you to think about this question. What does the surface culture you live in now look like? Cultural archetypes represent different ways the brain organizes itself. There are a number of different cultural archetypes. We're going to focus on two that relate to cultural identity. The individualist cultural archetypes typically reflect Western ideals. And these ideals include being independent, self-reliant, achievement-oriented, competitive, assertive, pleasure-seeking, self-assured, direct, and guided by self-interest. The second cultural archetype we're going to look at today is called the collectivist cultural archetype. And these typically reflect Eastern ideals. These include being socially interdependent, connected, moderate or traditional, cooperative, obedient, self-sacrificing, sensitive, self-controlled, and equalitarian. There are more cultural archetypes than these two. In reference to these two cultural archetypes, I invite you to further explore your cultural identity. Please respond to these questions, whether on paper, on the computer, or out loud. Were you raised in an individualist or collectivist culture? There is no right or wrong answer. Second question, what can you appreciate about the cultural archetype you were not raised with? What is creative decolonization? Creative decolonization involves the use of the creative process to create art and conversations that empower all people to embrace their multicultural heritage. That's all for this module, folks, but we invite you to explore other self-paced creative and cultural learning opportunities available at www.creativedecolonization.org.